Am I? There we go. <clears throat> set up sit up straight mostly all right so it's been a while uh, I've been uh, I've been traveling a lot lately and it's been it's been fine but I'm back um, I'm back to currently it's like 33 degrees which is just barely above freezing here in the homestead um, on Monday it was in the high 60s and I was outside using a rattle can spray priming stuff and um, and then on Wednesday it snowed four inches as one does and then um, now most of that is melted but this morning it's pretty lousy um, and then this upcoming week it's supposed to be in the 50s sometimes the high 50s but it's also supposed to rain a lot so you know these are the ways these things work let's see what have we got going on in the chat We've got uh, hi from France, good morning from Central Texas, um, good morning from Berlin, Germany, Manchester, Paraguay, um, <clears throat> Edmonton, Southern Spain, North Carolina, Mexico, uh, Poland, what else have we got here? Uh, Southampton, Rochester, New York, Ontario, Canada, Emily says, hi, everyone, uh, everybody. I'm actually off work today, yay. Well, that is a good thing to hear. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, Adelaide, Australia, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, Wales, Sweden. What else? Turin, Italy. Spring is finally feeling springy after lots of years of hotness. Well, that's, that's good. Snowing in Michigan this morning. Um, uh, let's see. Getting myself hyped for the Game of Thrones season premiere tonight by painting some Starks from Song of Ice and Fire. It's good. I, it's a good way to, to use your time, I think. North Carolina, uh, Norwich. Let's see here, Singapore. Um, good morning from Japan. Was super happy to meet you at Acon. Absolutely, uh, I'm glad to have met you as well. And if you're the person I think that I met from Japan, I think that you gave me the cool little. Um, Space Marine guy. Uh, yes, you were on the you were on the wrong account. So there you go. Uh, yeah, I have not opened said. Um, actually, it's Terminator. It's a series two of the Space Marine heroes, and uh, he gave me one of those, which was very nice. So um, maybe I'll do a live unboxing at some point. Not today because I it's in the basement. It's not here within arm's reach. So <clears throat> what else have we got here? VJ Morph says, "Hey Adam, nice to have you back. It's it's good to be back. I'm I'm glad." Um, I don't have any more traveling. Like, I have to go. We have a trade show that we're going to, but it's only an hour and a half drive away, and that's in, like, late May. And then June. June will be a busy one, um, but it's not June yet, so that's fine. What else have we got here? Washington, D.C., here ready to prime all the Lannister troops with my airbrush. Woo. Yeah, actually, um, yesterday I spent a good portion of the earlier part of the day with Sam. If you follow me on Instagram, you saw some behind-the-scenes pictures of the next series of videos that Sam and I are doing. And um, he was, for the most part, like of the three videos we shot, two of them were using, I think, Lannister uh, cavalry. Like he showed some techniques on some Song of Ice and Fire stuff. Um, he and his girlfriend are getting into that because she's a huge fan of the books and they watched the show together, I believe. And so there was a bunch of it at Adepticon and so they picked up a whole bunch. And so he's been going to town on it. Um, but yeah. Let's see here. Um, greetings from Gigabytes in Atlanta. Looking forward to meeting you or seeing you at Origins. Yeah, we're. I'm always looking forward to Origins. That's a good convention. I will be there. Um, I saw... Several folks from Gigabytes TV at Gamma. Um, I saw. Did I see anybody from Gigabytes at Adepticon? I don't think so. 
At least not that I remember. Not that I remember. Um, what else have we got here? Let's see here. Hello from Germany. <clears throat> Patrick asks, is it worth it to buy leftover uh, Warhammer Fantasy Battles models from and battalions from my friendly local game store? Most are at 50% discount. I mean, honestly, at 50% discount, if they're models that you're interested in, then I would say sure, absolutely. Um, you may even, if they're like out of print stuff, like Tomb Kings and things like that, you may want to take a look on eBay first and see if people are selling them on eBay and getting decent prices for them, and then you might want to just buy them and flip them if you're not interested in the actual, um, you know, Tomb Kings yourself. Um, but generally, when they switched over to Age of Sigmar, they made War Scrolls for pretty much all of the old models, so you should be able to go either into the app or online and find War Scrolls for nearly anything that you can buy that's old, you know, fantasy battle stuff, and then you could use that in your armies or whatever um so yeah it's 50 percent off it's not a bad deal now it's obviously not the cool new stuff necessarily you know that's fine um like my death army uh is mostly old models it's a lot of old skeletons and stuff like that so <clears throat> royce miles brown says hi thanks for the 28 great reading yeah that 28 magazine was very cool and i was glad that i kind of I don't even remember where I saw a post or a Twitter or something about it. And I thought, oh, I'll check that out. And then I was really impressed with it, which is why I made the video. So I'm glad that I was able to help you, uh, or help people in general, hopefully, uh, find out about that kind of stuff. Um, well, da, da, da. Good morning from Sacramento, California. Um, what else? We got here. You can you can totally get war scrolls for anything. My wood elves from the Bronze Age are on there. Uh, trick is figuring out which scroll it goes to. Yeah, I remember when uh, there used to be a document, or was it in the? I don't remember where it was, but there used to be. If you downloaded the specific war scroll for one specific uh, unit, then that wasn't going to help you out. But they used to have, and I don't know if they still do, but they used to have like here's all the war scrolls for the wood elves and here's all the war scrolls for the whatever and then you could at the at back of that book they would go through and list a whole bunch of really old models and go well if you've got one of these then use this war scroll and you got one of these he's now called this or whatever and that kind of stuff so that was sort of useful if you can find those still on gw's website where they take like here's all the orcs and goblins in one document rather than having to download each document separately for each unit in the back of those if I remember correctly they do have um lists that say this old model is now using this war scroll if if it's not super obvious you know i mean honestly also they changed a bunch of names like the um nurgle chaos lord uh, which is what that model was originally called, and I think is still technically called on the. Now it's called the like Lord of Decay or something like that. You know, like they've that kind of jazz. They've just done a little bit of marketing change. So, uh oh, there's that kitty that wants to go on. But hey, okay, well she's gonna stay over there. Um, let's see here. Um. Do you magnetize any of the options for your models? If so, uh, what is your minimum requirement to bother with it? I haven't magnetized stuff in a long time, but when I did, used to, it used to be that I had a pretty simple, um, more often than not, it was like Space Marine Sergeants that needed to get like a different weapon sometimes and I wanted to be able to swap back and forth. Um, I have seen people magnetize wrists that seems a little bit more difficult than I maybe want to go through. So what I would do is I would magnetize at the shoulder. I've also seen people magnetize at the shoulder, but then also magnetize the shoulder pad. So they pop off the shoulder pad, then pop off the arm, pop a new arm on, and then pop the shoulder pad back on. That again is also, seems like a lot of work in my mind. So what I would end up doing is just making from the shoulder, it would basically from the shoulder on down, including the shoulder pad, would be just one piece, and including the gun or whatever. And then I would just swap that entire arm, including the shoulder pad, which means I had to have two shoulder pads for that, you know. And I had, but I had to have two arms anyway. So yeah, 
Um, but yeah, that's that's for me that was the way I used to do it. But honestly, it feels as if well, it feels as if to some degree they're not wanting that like the. There used to be a lot more options. When you would look at, right here I have an example. So this is the Vanguard Space Marines kind of mini, mini codex. There's not a lot of options anymore for specific, like here's a captain in Phobos armor, um, and he's, he's over here someplace. And basically you can pretty much build him one way. Like he comes with a Mastercrafted Instigator Bolt Carbine, bolt pistol combat knife frag grenades and, and, and that's it and then there's nothing that says oh if you want to give him this you can do this and if you want to give him that they've gotten a little bit more into that you see the same thing in um age of sigmar like age of sigmar is about not about swapping a lot of weapons as much anymore um and i don't know i think that it's because i don't know it, it, it could be because people were tired of, you know, having to pick all these things and, and, and magnetizing and stuff. And I don't know that it's necessarily... Honestly, I don't 100% know if it's beneficial to Games Workshop to not give you as many options as you used to. Because if you had a lot of options in the past, then you needed to buy more models to be able to swap them. At the very least, you needed to have two models. One that, you know, has this arm, you know, loadout and this one that has that loadout. Whereas, if you also just magnetized it, then you just had one model, but you had multiple arms. But you still needed to buy more arms, and it was a whole thing. So it seems odd to me that they've decided kind of to, like, just kind of nip that in the bud. It could just be because they just want to try to simplify things a little bit, which is fine. Um, yeah, so there's that kind of stuff. Uh, let me see here. Randall asks, Adam, how was the trip to Austin? Good convention. So um, last weekend I was in Austin, Texas, and I had never been to Texas before. Um, that part of Texas reminds me a lot of Wisconsin. It's just three months in the future, because it's like, it's uh, what do you you know? It's like it's like summer there already. It, it's like Wisconsin summer there already in my mind. Um, there's already leaves on all the trees and stuff, and you know it's warm and whatever. Um, but there wasn't like it was it it didn't look very different. There weren't very many. There weren't really pine trees or anything kind of, you know, like deciduous, I don't know, whatever, you know, those types of trees, needle type trees around, like there are around here. Um, and the birds sounded a bit different, but otherwise it didn't look a ton different. The convention itself was small. It was maybe 200-ish people, which is not too bad. Uh, it was their first year. Um, Steve Jackson Games, if you're not familiar, they do all the Munchkin games and all that kind of jazz. But I remember them mostly from some of their earliest games, which were um, Ogre which they did a Kickstarter for a couple of years ago to bring out the newest version of Ogre, which was this humongous giant box. Uh, and then now they're doing, they're very close, I guess sometime this year they're doing a Kickstarter for the new version of Car Wars. Car Wars was really my jam in college. We used to play it like nearly every Friday night. And it's a, you know, it's in the future and cars all have guns on them and you can, you know, whatever. Um, but it was played with little cardboard chips on a graph kind of like maps and stuff like that and there was a ton of bookkeeping and a ton of math and all that kind of jazz you know if you were moving at like when we were playing there were 10 movement phases if you were moving at 40 miles per hour then you moved on the first one but not the second one like the third one but not the fourth one the fifth one and if you had to spread it out so like someone who was moving 100 miles an hour would move on every phase whereas someone who's only moving 10 miles an hour would only move on like the first one and then not move again or activate. So you'd move and you could shoot and it was a whole thing. The new version, uh, if you saw some of the pictures that I posted on Facebook and Instagram, so the new version honestly reminds me a good deal of X-Wing, Star Wars X-Wing, um, in that it is played now with plastic models. They're on little bases. Um, you have these kind of like rulery type things. It's not quite like X-Wing where you have the ruler that makes the turn and you have to move it from here to the, you know, that kind of thing but it does have a movement turning key. So you might slide it forward, and then if you want to turn, there's kind of like a, a bendy part, and you can, it's, 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 it's unique, it's different, um, but it's kind of cool. Um, and then instead of having just like a sheet of paper that had all your information on it and all your stats and all that kind of jazz, now you have this square kind of um, cardboard thing with a round speed dial in it, and you have these little sliders that you kind of move, and so you keep track of, 
how much tire damage, your engine damage, what speed you're at, and then you have your armor in the front and the sides and the back, and then you have weapons and devices which you attach kind of to the outside. So like if this is a gun on the front, you put it by the front part of it, uh, of the, the card. If it's a you know smoke uh, screen, you put that in the back, because if you put it in the front, then you would smoke yourself out. You don't want to do that. And like, you know, you can't put a flamethrower in the front because you would just fire it and just set yourself on fire if you were driving forward. So you put flamethrowers either on the back or the sides and stuff like that. And you have these, and everything you put on there is cards. So, um, it does again remind me a little bit of X-wing in that way, in that you are saying, "Okay, well, I've got this vehicle, this this starship, but I want to put these torpedoes on it and one of these astro droids or whatever." And it, but it, it's a little bit more locational um, because depending on which side of your main speed dial you put them on is dependent on where they actually are on the car. And then you always have a a gunner and a driver. Um, I think it's almost always you always have both. Um, but yeah, it's very it's. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting. I think the people who are really attached to the old way are not going to enjoy it as much because it is very different. Um, I have some rose-colored glasses towards the back of the way it was, but I do see where this is going to be probably more accessible to more people, um, certainly. So, yeah. But, yeah, it was it was a cool little convention. It was just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um like in a industrial park, and so I got a hotel room, uh, like a Super 8 near a Jack in the Box, and I had to kind of take a lift back and forth because uh, it was not. It it was I could have walked it, but it rained a bunch while we were there, and also there was it was just a little sketchy. The, the southeastern um, Austin it was not. I was was like hmm, but otherwise I did not get downtown. I did not get to any of the fancy places or do anything like that. I was in and out pretty quickly. <laughs> A lot of cat shenanigans there, um, but yeah. So it's a uh, it was a good trip, you know. And I got to see some people that I knew in, in Austin. Uh, we had uh, dinner at Matt's El Rancho or something like that. It's a Tex-Mex place. That was lovely. Um, but yeah. So there we go. Uh, let me see here. What else have we got? Um, boop boop boop. Let me see, what else have we got? Um, Star Wars Legion is doing a General Kenobi and General Grievous for Clone Wars, says Dr. Robert Kelso. Um, yeah, I saw the models at Adepticon, and um, so they've got Clone War dudes, you know, so it's you've got um, your droids, your droid army, um, the droid, what are the ones that roll? They got some of those, they got the regular Roger Roger droids, and then on the other side, you've got the clones, clone troopers. Um, the models look better than the original, you know, normal, like, um, spa uh, not space marines, uh, stormtroopers and, uh, and Vader and, and all that kind of stuff. They do look better. Um, I was always a big General Grievous fan because he's, he's kind of such a, such a doofus and whatever. Um, like, I didn't watch a ton of the cartoon, but when you watched the Clone Wars cartoon, every episode he was in, it was always like, okay, I gotta go. And, like, he would, like, as soon as, like, something would even slightly happen, he would get in his weird, um, you know, uh, spaceship car thing or whatever and <laughs> take off. Um, and that was kind of the normal storyline. So uh, the model that they had in the case at Adepticon was, yeah, it was okay. But I did hear from, actually, I think from Gaddis Gaming, from Lee. Uh, he said that um, he said that it's supposed to come in three different poses. Like, you can put it together different ways. So maybe just the pose that they had there was kind of meh. But, um, yeah, so it was kind of cool. Uh, I don't know that I will necessarily get into it. Maybe? Eh, I don't know. Um, like I've said in the past, I kind of like the system. Like, the, the game system is cool. I get a little tired of all the custom dice, you know. Um, but I really like the kind of bidding system about how you who goes first and that kind of stuff and the cards that you use to do that. I dig that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, cat shenanigans. Yes, there was... Uh, my wife came from the kitchen, the door was closed, and then the door swung open, and then there was a cat, and then there was other cats, and then there was a... Bit of a cat chain reaction, so yeah. Um, 
So let's see here. What else have we got? Um, useful G says, I have my in-laws staying. I'll see your kitty shenanigans and raise you relative shenanigans. Yeah, well, they, do they get startled when the kitchen door gets opened? You know, I mean, I suppose they might. Uh, George says, need more Warcry info. Yeah, there wasn't... I mean, other than the stuff that they had at the press event on Wednesday, which, God, it seems like it's so far away, and it's really only three Wednesdays ago? Yeah, anyway. The press event that they did uh, was at, at Adepticon was fine. It, um, it showed a little bit more information about Warcry, which was interesting to me. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it's Age of Sigmar Warcry. It's kind of kill team for Age of Sigmar, but they've changed things a bit in that, like, you know how in kill team you can use normal 40k models, specific ones. You can't, you know, go crazy and just bring a bunch of Imperial Knights, but there's certain models that are already in the line that you can use, and then you can build your kill teams, and then you play on the smaller board and the terrain and all that jazz. Um, Warcry is along those same lines, but A, it's Age of Sigmar, and B, it's not particularly, what am I trying to say? It's not, you can't just use your current Age of Sigmar models. The models are all specifically made for Warcry. So like the first, I don't know, six Warbands, I think, or something like that, are actually all just Chaos. So it's basically just Battles of Chaos versus Chaos. Now they did release at the convention um, at uh, Adepticon that there will be other factions as well. They showed like, because like in the in the in the one at um, I don't know, was it Las Vegas Open Gamma? I don't know where it was. They showed six icons, and these are the the six original war bands. And then now at um, Adepticon they showed those six, and then a whole bunch of others around them. And there were some that you could recognize. So it looks like there's going to be. After seeing the the the, the reveal or whatever at uh, Adepticon, it makes me think this. It makes me think they're taking the concept of Kill Team and they're kind of taking Necromunda and sort of squishing them together. And what I mean by that is Kill Team in that you're playing with small groups and you have three-dimensional stuff because the terrain that they're showing off is really very cool. It's very three-dimensional, kind of like the Kill Team terrain is. But instead of using models that are already in the line, they're kind of doing the Necromunda thing where they'll be selling, here's a box of Goliaths, here's a box of Vansar, you know, or Vansar or whatever. Um, so if you buy the starter box for uh, Warcry, it'll come with terrain and two forces, both of them chaos, fighting against each other. It's almost like a pit fight, sort of arena kind of a thing. Um, not really exactly, but it's kind of like that. They're fighting against each other. But then down the road, it sounds like they will just release boxes, kind of like they're doing with um, Necromunda, where they're just like, oh, here's a box of, you know, Vansar. Here's a box of, uh, what is it, Spurlocks, Warlocks, Gorlocks, whatever the hell those, are. Orlocks? Orlocks, I think. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I get the feeling that that's what they're going to do, is they're going to release the book separately, so whatever, if you just wanted to, if you already got your own terrain and your own board, you just need to buy a couple of sets of models, buy a book, and you're good to go. Um, but if you want to buy the starter box, it sounds like they're going to try to keep the starter box in stock longer. Like it's not kind of like the starter box that was for Kill Team, where they were just like they made the, a certain number of them and they went ta da. Um, I would be surprised, frankly, if just on a side note, I would be surprised if they if they didn't decide to re-release the starter box for. Um, Kill Team at some point. It's not available now, absolutely. I thought it was going to be available. It seemed like a smart thing to do, but they might bring it back again. From what I understand, they brought back the Grandmaster box for the, whatever that game is. Adeptus Titanicus, whatever. With the big, you know, with the the Warlords, but they're only that big. Um, that was originally, even right up front, they said this is limited edition, and then it was instantly disappeared, and then people got sketchy about it and then they're like well we'll bring it back so i don't know that could happen this summer maybe not i don't know um but for the all the people to constantly ask and i get a lot of it and i appreciate that people come and ask me these questions but uh if you're interested in kill team all you need is the book you don't need that starter box um it was a good deal but you can either buy the terrain separately or if you've already got terrain you can use that you don't have to have that specific board that they sell although they do sell you know, what do they call them? War, 
not war boards, war, war grounds, war, I don't know. They sell boxes that have like the board and some terrain and all that kind of stuff. So you could buy one of those. You could buy the book because you need the book for the rules. And then use whatever models that you can currently get from the line. You don't it like that. That starter box was a good deal money wise, but it is not a requirement. They sell the book separately and they're good. Warcry, from what I understand, they're trying to keep that book in stock more to do all that jazz, which is fine. Um, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Hey, Kathy Wapple, how you doing? Um, yeah. So I don't know when we'll hear more about Warcry. It's supposed to come out. Hmm, maybe late summer or was it later in the year i don't remember i think they did say it's definitely 2019 i just don't remember if it was late summer or if it was late 2019. uh i didn't take notes i'm not i'm not a, i'm not a news channel as it, as it turns out um so yes uh let me see here <clears throat> what else have we got Llama Juice says, Stormcasts looks to be in Warcry. Part of the reason I decided to build up a Stormcast army was I knew that they would be supported in just about every release and I wouldn't be stuck waiting for uh, for updates for years. Yeah, um, it looks like they'll have some Stormcast in there. Like I said, again, I have a suspicion they will probably be their own box for Warcry. Here's the one thing they did mention, though, which is interesting, too, is that every unit that you buy in Warcry, they will also make a um, War Scroll for so you can use it in Age of Sigmar. So you can't take Age of Sigmar models and bring them into Warcry, but you can take Warcry models just like you do in Shadespire, and then you there are there are um, War Scrolls so you can bring them into Age or yeah Age of Sigmar. So you can take stuff from Warcry and bring it the other way, which is nice. I I do like it when they give you models that you can use in multiple ways, like Blackstone Fortress. You can play Blackstone Fortress. They also have 40k rules for pretty much every model in that box. Plus, they also have um, kill team rules for most of those models too, which is cool. Um, let me see here. Um, Darren Walker says, I find myself enjoying skirmish games rather than big battles. I'm getting old. Yeah, you know, honestly, I'm in the same boat. I generally prefer skirmish games. Um, I have a 2,000-point Space Marine force that needs to be painted, and uh, I just I just want to paint skirmish games instead. Like last night, like I have not been able to hobby worth a damn for quite some time because of traveling and all that kind of stuff. And so there was at least one night this week that I sat down in the basement and did some hobbying, Partially because I was doing some testing for an upcoming video, but also partially just because I wanted to just sit and hobby and like zone and all that kind of stuff. Um, I've been working also on my Death Watch kill team. So then yesterday after I got done filming with Sam and then my wife and I went out and got some dinner and then I came home and then I just sat and painted um, some more until about 11 o'clock at night. And um, those Death Watch are fun. I'm getting, I'm getting close-ish to them being done. Um, what was I talking about? Sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. I missed it. Anyway, oh yeah, skirmish games versus big battles. Yes, so that all being said, however, I did, like I mentioned in the Adepticon Booty video, I did get into um, the other side from Weird Games. I bought a bunch of their stuff at Adepticon because it's all pre-built. So that's kind of nice. Um, I have a big wait oh hang on that's the wrong side <clears throat> there's a big fishman that i bought that comes with one of the armies and he's pretty cool and like all you have to do is put them onto the base like like i said they're pre-built so here's the base it's a big honking base and then here is well, that's not completely true. This one, he does have a couple little riders that you can choose to put on or not. And they're small fishmen with spears. But this is the big one. So there's your big fishman. He's built. I didn't have to do any of that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to lie. There's gaps. Oh, there's gaps. So um, I'm going to use some of the AK Interactive uh, putty that I bought at the LVO. And we'll see if that works out. But yeah, big uh, big honking fishman. Like he is easily, I don't know what is that guy six seven inches tall. He's kind of awesome. So um, 
that is as a battle game, it's still small in comparison to say something like 40k. Like so, yeah. But generally, I'm interested in playing skirmish games because I can get a lot, kind of a more of a. I can get a little bit more interested in each specific model. I guess that's partially what I'm trying to say there. Um, Jess Kitten says, Hey, Uncle Adam, do you know of any Viking-themed skirmish games? I do. It's not available yet. It's coming out in late May. But uh, if you do a little bit of Google searching out there, uh, you can find a game called Ragnarok. Um, from Osprey Games. So Osprey is the company that makes uh, Frostgrave and Gaslands and stuff like that. Um, and a bunch of other games. Dracula's America, all kinds of cool stuff. And um, they're doing a lot of good work. And now they've got a game by a friend of mine, uh, Tim Karkluski, which I probably mispronounced. But Tim uh, wrote a skirmish game for them uh, that's all about Vikings and stuff like that. And it's called Ragnarok. And it will be coming out in late May. I have a copy, but not within arm's reach. So, um, yeah, because Osprey sent me a copy early, which was very nice of them. Um, it looks really good. It's a gorgeous book. It's a hardcover. Um, not not a big, big book. It's like, I don't know, it's like slightly smaller. Um, not like a codex, or you know, but it's smaller. But um, nice and thick, lots of gorgeous artwork. Uh, I haven't really got a chance to read through a ton of it. I've been looking at like, what the stats mean and stuff like that and everything, but I haven't got into the actual like play sequence. But um, the book, it's it's definitely about Vikings, and it's also not it's not like historical particularly. Like there is some sort of magicy kind of shenanigans going on, more like Norse mythology lore type stuff versus you know anything else. But yeah, it's quite cool. So yeah. <clears throat> Uh, Darren says that Fishman looks like the crazy underground dude that Luke fights in Star Wars at Jabba's Palace. So much news. That's called the Rancor, and you're not wrong. He does look a little bit like the Rancor, but he's going to be kind of blue-green and, and sort of slimy, so he will look less like the Rancor once he's done. Um, uh, let me see here. I miss which game the Fishman is for. Which game is it? It's called The Other Side by Weird Games, the people who make Malifaux. Um, it, 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 it takes place in the same universe as Malifaux, but the battles are actually taking place on Earth. It, Malifaux is a game about how there's this rip, kind of, in reality, and, um, and there's a long story as to how it got there. But on the other side of, of that is, is Malifaux, which is this sort of city, and there's stuff going on and whatnot. It's a long story. But... Um, now the battle has come back to Earth, and that's what the game of the other side is. So, <clears throat> yes, there you go. Um, oh, yeah, Saga. Saga is also a, uh, that's a good point. Saga is a Viking skirmish game. Saga is much more historical, although I guess they did just recently come up with a new kind of fantasy magic-y version of it, too. But generally, when it first started, it was very historical. It was, um, you know, you've got Vikings, but you've also got, like, Saxons, and you've got all kinds of different other folks that you can play. Um, but, yeah, definitely. Um, so, Uncle Adam, are the conventions slowing down? Um, like I said, right now, I don't have anything going for April. Um, in May, I'm going to be in Madison towards the end part of May for, like, one day for a, a trade show for work for the for game four um and that madison's like an hour and a half drive for us so i don't we're not even planning on staying over but yeah we'll be there for that um and that's a trade show that's predominantly like stores come to it and they're the ones walking up and down the aisles so it's not like a game convention it's more of a trade show um and then june uh i've got a little convention in june that I'm looking forward to quite a bit. It's the Tabletop Minions Expo 2019, which if you're able to make it, you should totally do so. Um, you'll get to see all kinds of people there. Uh, Emily's going to be here. VJ Morph is coming all the way from Australia, which is very far away, by the way. Um, and uh, a lot more people as well. So, yeah, you should definitely try to go to that. That will be, again, like I said, the 8th and 9th of June um, 2019. And so that'll be a lot of fun. And then... Um, so that's the 9th is Sunday. On the 12th, which is like Wednesday, I'm then flying to Columbus. 
and going to Origins. So I'll be at Origins for, I don't know, five days or something like that. Um, and then I come back from Origins, and then the next weekend after that, I, well, not even the next weekend, later the next week, I then fly to Buffalo, New York, at which point I will rent a car, and then I will drive it across the border into Canada, and I will go to the Mini Wargaming grand opening of the new Battle Bunker uh, giant building or whatever that they're working on. Um, actually, Dave just sent me some video footage of the uh, the pretty much finished now, uh, like the tournament space that they've got, and it looks it's super cool. I mean, it, I, I don't want to say it looks like a Hollywood set, but it looks way more like a Hollywood set than anything else that I've seen out of any other kind of wargaming channel anywhere. It's really qu quite quite neat. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. But June's going to be a long month. <clears throat> um, and then... So there's probably going to be some sort of... Oh God, I'm going to have to... There's going to be probably at least a two-week... Maybe... Oh, God. I'm going to have to figure out how to do the Sunday show. It's going to be a difficult one. I haven't quite really cracked that nut yet. But that one's going to be uh, a hoot. And then I'm going to have pretty much the entire month of July not going anywhere, which will be great. And then August, the first day of August, uh, is driving to Indianapolis for Gen Con. Be at Gen Con from the 1st to the 5th or first, whatever. It's a really long time, it seems like. And then the middle part of August is nothing. And then the very last part of August is Nova. Uh, Nova Open, the Northern Virginia Open in the D.C. area, where I will see, again, hopefully plenty of you folks, and that'll be great. And then in late October, I will be at a convention in Illinois called Dragonfall. That is also now on my list. I don't know if there's any other conventions that I'm going to in the year that I can think of right now. But that's, that's the current list as far as my travels are concerned, so it's going to be interesting. Uh, George says, met somebody at the local GW store wearing a Pachow shirt, by the way. Oh, that's cool. That's a lot of fun. <clears throat> Kelly says, my first Adepticon was this year. If you consider yourself a miniatures hobbyist, you need to go to Adepticon. It was amazing fun. Yes. Um, Adepticon was uh, spectacular this year. Tim asks, what game should I run at TMX? Depends on what you want to run. Um, I would go something skirmishy, obviously, because that's kind of your area. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a... Uh, Adepticon is great. It's this year was. I mean, I talked to probably the most people that I've ever talked to, um, which was awesome, and um, I didn't buy a ton of stuff. I mean, I got a, I went a little pear shaped on Sunday and bought like a bunch of that stuff from, like I said, from the other side. But you know, there was Fishman and and all that kind of stuff. What am I going to do? Um, but the classes that I got to teach were a lot of fun. I got to meet a lot of people. They were both full. Um, the one class that I took about sculpting with green stuff, it was mostly about hairdos uh, on, on your Space Marines or whatever. So you can give them like a nice, uh, was that a, what's that, a Caesar cut? Is that what um, George, Clo George Clooney used to rock back in the 90s? Um, actually, I don't know if I could actually pull that off. But, uh, you know, on the model, I don't think I could pull that off. It's too small. But nonetheless, I did take that class from Tom Mason, I think is the name. And I think he has a YouTube channel about mainly sculpting, which I'm probably going to watch more about. Um, I did purchase some sculpting tools. Like he gave us each, not to keep, but to use during the class, these kind of sculpting tools. Uh, they're like little silicone tip, kind of weird little... It's like a paintbrush, but instead of bristles at the end, it's got this weird different little shaped silicone tip. And so um, nothing sticks to silicone for the most part. So... Uh, it was actually quite nice, and it was kind of fun to sculpt with, so I could see myself maybe trying to do a little more green stuff uh, sculpting with the things that I learned, and now that I've ordered some of the tools and they showed up for Amazon or whatever, um, I'd like to try a little bit more of that stuff too. So that was very cool. I shot with um, my new big honking camera. Um, I shot nine interviews with... <clears throat> different seminar teachers. Now, this is not a video like the one I did a couple years ago where I interviewed like seven different painters. This was more along the lines of, um, this was actually a video that we're making, I'm making for Adepticon. It will be on my channel, but it's, and we're probably going to release it as we get closer to registration next year. So it's going to sit for a while. But the idea is that um, 
we want to release this video to explain like this is why you come to Adepticon if you want to get better at painting it's because you can take classes from some of the best in the world so um, yeah so that kind of stuff I want to um, be able to I, I'm, I'm, I've got it all you know all dumped because you get back and you've got all these cards and stuff and you want to get it all on your computer and back it up so it's safe so I've done all of that um, but that video I'm gonna probably start working on in the next couple of months um, just trying to figure out like how to put it together properly but it was a lot of fun to shoot um, I talked to Ben Comets I talked to Sam obviously I talked to uh, Devin Marr I talked to oh gosh I can't remember everybody Seth 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 whose last name I forget I have it all written down so I got that going for me but um, yeah I like I said it was a bunch of people and it was a lot of fun so Uh, Wargaming Lobby asks, Adam, did you get to do the interview video? Yeah, I did. Like I said, I, I got to shoot those. I did it over two days. Um, um, I wanted to do one where I kind of a little bit more like the video I did a couple years ago where I asked new questions to a bunch of painters, and I didn't get to that, but I'm going to just look at getting that next year. Cletus 3K says, taking your shortcuts class at Nova. Pumped. Well, good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, I'm looking forward to doing that. I've never taught a, a, a painting class before. So um, at Nova in late August, early September, I'm going to be teaching two classes about painting shortcuts, about how to get your models on the table as quickly as possible so you can game with them. Um, and uh, that's going to be very, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to that. <clears throat> um, Gaddis Gaming says that the Shattered Crown Championships will be run at TMX this year using the Guards rule system, 750 point armies. Nice. I will let. Um, Matt at Game Four, Matt or no, because he's got a um, he's got a uh, Shattered Crown army that's mostly painted, I think. So I'm gonna I'll let him know about that. Um, let's see what else have we got. Kathy says the silicone sculpting tools are fantastic. Yeah, I really like I, I really liked messing with the one that I was using for the hair thing. You know, it was just it was so crazy to be like poking and kind of sculpting green stuff and not having it constantly stick to the tool and all that kind of stuff. So that was actually really cool. Um, I Just the fact that that's a thing, like a lot of times when you're, when you're sculpting green stuff with normal tools, what they tell you is you need to keep your tools wet because then the silicone won't stick as easily. Or you can put something on them to kind of lubricate it so it doesn't do it. But any kind of lubrication like that that you put onto green stuff whether it's some people will use chapstick, some people will use, um, honestly, they'll use like KY jelly, stuff like that. Um, I'm always nervous that then the paint won't stick to it. Like if you prime it and there's still goop on there or something that's, you know, to help lubricate it so you can sculpt, then that's going to be problematic. If you're just using water, obviously the water will evaporate before the time comes for you to prime, hopefully. Um, but using these silicone tools, you don't have to put anything on them. You don't have to even get them wet. They just don't stick to... Um, to to the to the, the the green stuff, I didn't realize until just recently that almost nothing sticks to silicone. But then yesterday when we were filming, me and Sam, I was trying to make a snoot. So I have this little tiny light, and it has it's just this little tiny LED light. It's like a little cube, and it runs off a of battery power. Or it's you, know, you charge it with USB. Anyway, um, and I was just trying to shoot some light down onto where he's using his hands down here, but I don't want the light to hit the camera that's hitting him in the face. So I took a uh, black gaffer's tape and I like made like a tube and put it around this this light so that the light would just shoot out and not. So I think it worked. But there's a silicone dome that goes over the front of this light so that it's kind of like a diffuser. And I could not get the tape to stick to that damn dome. And I was just like, what is the problem? All of a sudden I'm like, oh yeah, silicone. Oh uh, yeah. So interesting. Um, ba -doo, ba -doo. let's see. Um, what else have we got here? We've got Gaddis Gaming. We've got yep. Uh, when do you think the Shadow Spear Primera stuff will be released on their own? Hmm. I don't know. Um, I. I mean, I would say normally I would give it like I would think a couple of months, if not maybe a touch more. But it sounds like the Shadow Spear box is gone, pretty much. So. 
Um, which again is weird, you know, but I think that, yeah, that I, again, I don't understand why they do that. I, this is why I'm not in, uh, not a business person as it turns out is because I don't understand why this happens where they just decide, well, we'll make some, you know, and then we'll be done with it. Um, one bummer, speaking of about limited edition, the one bummer about Adapticon was I kind of wanted to get the limited edition um, uh, Adepticon Primaris Lieutenant guy at the GW booth during during Adepticon, but there was never a time when it didn't look like there was at least a one hour wait for that booth. Like they only had one register for reasons that no one under ever, ever understands when they know that they have a line all the time. How about two registers? Then you could get through the line twice as quick in theory. Mathematically, maybe not, but whatever. Nope, always just the one register. And so I just never, I, there would be times I would pick it up and look at it and go, yeah, this is very cool, but I'm not standing in that line. Because that, like, one hour was like the shortest. There were a lot of times, like early on in the first day, it looked like that line was hours long. So I'm like, no, no thank you. Um, and then, yeah, so I just never got one. And I went on eBay after I got back, and they were, like, selling for 60 or 70 or 80 bucks. So I was like, well, all right. Now, I've got a friend who told me that he's pretty sure that they may also be selling it at Gen Con as well. It may have not just been Adepticon exclusive. It might be Convention 2019 exclusive. So if it's not at Gen Con, it might also be at Nova. Um, but I'll try Gen Con, see if I can... Because sometimes the line's not usually as bad at Gen Con because... There's, in the grand scheme of things, there's kind... I don't want to say there's fewer Wargamers at Gen Con than there are at Adepticon. Adepticon was about 5,600 this year from what um, I've read. But out of 60,000, I think there's probably more than 5,000 um, Wargamers. But I think they're spread out a lot more. So maybe they all can't stand in line at the same time. I don't know. I've never seen a line at Gen Con for a, the Games Workshop booth that is as big as the one at... Adapticon, like even like Las Vegas Open, there was never a line quite nearly as long. Like I stood in the line at the Las Vegas Open to buy some Forge World heads, you know, and it wasn't that like like you know the first day, yeah, it was kind of crazy, but then you know you come back like the second day, it was fine. So, <clears throat> um, let's see here. Adron says my local Warhammer store has four Shadow Spear sets. Not sure, so sh not sure what's going on. That's always the way it works. There's always like pockets of like, like something's been gone everywhere, but some stores got like three of them for some reason. Like the video that I did on Friday where I talked about Inquisition or Inquisitor. Sorry. So Inquisitor was a game that came out in 2001, and I saw them playing at Adepticon. I had already read like the magazine and all that kind of stuff, and then me and one of the guys from work were at a local shop, um, not in Oshkosh, but in Appleton. We were at a local game shop in Appleton, and uh, we, he was looking for some WizKids models, uh, the like bandits or something like that for D&D. And I was just standing there, because I, I remember they have like really old GW, like anytime that there's like old codexes and old books and stuff like that, they just kind of put them all in this one shelf. So I'm just like, hmm, I'll go look. And I looked, and like right there at the top was a copy of Inquisitor, still at the regular like $45 like original price in basically pretty good condition. I mean it was not used it's just been sitting on their shelf since literally 2002. So people open it, look through it, and put it back, you know, all that kind of stuff and it's just never moved. But like if you try to go on eBay and buy a copy that's as nice as that, you're going to spend more than $45, I'll tell you that. So um, lucky is what it was happened but yeah, you'll get that. You'll get these a lot of times the shops if they're smart they will notice what's going on and then they'll be like, hmm. And then if they see that, well, I bought four and they're not moving, but everyone's complaining about how they're out all over the country. Well, then you flip them on eBay and you make a little bit more money. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the way that works. Um, but not every shop has got the time to do that because store owners are frequently, you know, they have to wear multiple hats and all that jazz. So, yeah. Um... Emily says the Gen Con line at GW is fast. They have tons of people in registers. Yeah, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't know why they wouldn't bring a second register uh, at uh, Adapticon, but that's what they do. Um, 
Cahoon says, Uncle Adam, I'm totally blocked with my current squad of Thousand Suns Terminators. Should I try another minis or just keep trying harder? I'm going mad. Thank you. Uh, amazing show. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, what I generally do, I'm not saying this is going to work for everybody, but what I generally do is if I get blocked on some models, then I either go and start working on some other models or um, another trick that I've used in the past is I go do chores, which suck. So then you want to go back and paint sooner. You know what I mean? Like if I'm like, oh, I just, I did, and you just go mow the lawn or something like that if you've got a lawn to mow or a shovel or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. Mowing the lawn sucks way worse than shoveling, in my opinion. Um, so doing that kind of stuff, then you're kind of glad to not have to do that after you're done. Um, or, and it's hard to do this with the lawn mowing, but like, if, let's say you're like, all right, I'll go weed the garden or whatever. I don't, I don't really have a garden. But I'll go weed something, and then you can get tired of it and quit halfway through, and then go back to painting. Whereas if you do that with the lawn mowing, then the neighbors look at you funny. But whatever. Um, yeah, I just yeah, that's kind of um, yeah. I, I I find that if I get stuck, and I don't, ha it doesn't happen with me, thankfully, much with um, that kind of stuff with those types of. Um, things I don't usually have to worry about it too much but if I do just making myself go do something else I don't want to do but it's like one of those adult things you're supposed to get done makes me want to go back and do the painting quicker so that's what I do um, give that a try or like I said paint some other stuff work on a piece of train um, I made a video about it a really long time ago about motivational tricks or something uh, and I mentioned a bunch of this but I can't do the pachow on the live show so sorry about that um Let's see here. Michael Strange says, My week-long vacation soon in a cabin will be spent reading in build mode. That sounds like a good time, honestly. I Yeah, that would be lovely. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's see here. Joe says that Chimera and Appleton, which is the store I was talking about that I picked up Inquisitor, was always great because he had huge stockpiles of original Deadlands RPG books. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true, too. Um, the guy who owns the Chimera uh, hobbies in Wisconsin, there's one in Fond du Lac and one in Appleton. Uh, he also, if you go to Gen Con ever, he also has a huge booth at Gen Con where he sells like RPGs, all kinds of crazy books, like all kinds of old out of print stuff. Companies like want to get rid of things that aren't selling anymore. So then he sends a semi over and buys this, the pallets of stuff for like super crazy cheap. And then he keeps them in warehouses. And then he takes them to Gen Con. And then it's like, buy one book, get three free and stuff like that. And if you've ever seen that booth at Gen Con, that's, that's what he does a ton of it. And um, so, yeah, he's got a massive amount of stuff. So tons and tons of old things you can find at his shop as well, uh, but also new stuff too. So. Um, let me see here. People talking about picking up the Kill Team starter box in Spain long after it was sold out in the U.S. Well, that's cool. Um, Six Gunner 86 says, Hi, Adam. Our local gaming store organized a painting competition during April. I converted a GW Skeleton Knight as a White Walker. It's been a fun project. That does sound like a good time. Yeah, I wish that... Um, hmm... I kind of wish that some of the local stores would do something like that around here. I think it might be kind of cool to do some painting contests. Get people to, you know, to actually paint. Um, could get Sam to be the uh, judge or, or something like that. That'd be good. <clears throat> Jonathan Westmoreland says, One of the GW employees at Adepticon said that this year's booth was an experiment as it was the first time that they were selling both GW and Forge World products. Yeah, I think that's true. I guess if they're going to sell GW and Forge World projects, then maybe they could have two registers. I'm just saying. Um, uh, if it met their expectations, they were going to have two separate larger booths next year. Hmm. Well, I hope so. Irrational Gaz says, Thanks for the Friday video. That 28 magazine had totally passed me by, and it's very much my jam. Such grim, many darkness. That's true. I, I do. I mean... There's a part of me, because I used to be into zines back in the day, like when I was in high school, I used to be the art director for a Star Trek fanzine that uh, two friends of mine uh, had been putting together, and then I got involved and became the art director. And that was back pre-internet, this is in the late 80s, so um, 
one of my friends, he his grandparents bought him a photocopier, like a used photocopier from a church or something like that. And so we would print these zines on the photocopier that he had in his basement and then mail them out. We had like 150 subscribers worldwide and we would send out these this, these, this Star Trek fan magazine. And so I've always been interested in zines and that kind of stuff. And the idea of creating a cool zine in full color and all that stuff is PDF and then being able to just send it wherever you want or just have people download it, to me is very cool. Um, so I like that they made that as sort of their benchmark for like this is how we're going to produce our content. I think that's very interesting because they could have just made like a website and just been like put up a blog post from time to time. But the fact that it's like a packaged kind of twice a year sort of special thing, I think is very cool. Um, I also personally prefer it because then I can just throw it on my iPad and then it's like I'm reading a magazine wherever I'm going, which is also a lot of fun. So yeah, definitely. Um, Calaxical? I'm probably mispronouncing that. Great seeing you live for once. Um, your videos have had a big impact on how I see the hobby. Started to work on a Warlord Titan again. That's progressing pretty well. Anyways, cheers from Finland. Well, thank you. Cheers to you as well. I'm glad that the videos are helping. Um, so, yeah. Let's see here. What else have we got going on? James Burge says, I did not know you did live stuff. Absolutely great content you put out for the new and returning tabletop interest players. Love your truth. Uh, thanks and keep up the good work. Oh, thank you very much, James. Yeah, no, I've been doing this live show on every other Sunday, hence it being called the uh, uh, the Every Other Sunday Show. Um, I've been doing it for, oh gosh, since 2015? Eh, maybe not. Maybe 2016. I'll have to double check. But it's been a while. Um, I'm generally pretty good about the every other part. Uh, every once in a while there's like some sort of weird travel, which is why there hasn't been one for the last two weeks. Um, but I did two back to back leading up to this, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's just basically like initially when I first started wanting to do this show, I almost was going to make it like a Twitch channel where I would be, you know, like working on models and then maybe answering some questions from the chat and all that stuff. And if you go back and look at the very first one, back even before it was called the Every Other Sunday Show, it was just called Tabletop Means Live, I think. Um, if you watch that very first one, I was working on Plague Monks, which are the little rat dudes from um, the Skaven guys. For, and um, I can't build, Lord knows I can't paint, but I can't build and talk at the same time. It just doesn't work. So for all those folks out there like Sam, uh, who's on Twitch under Samson Arts, um, who are able to paint to a high degree, also answer questions that they can read from the chat and all that kind of stuff, I, I big ups because I can't, I can't do that. So it, this show has basically turned into me reading questions from the chat and things like that and answering questions and all that kind of stuff. And that's pretty much it. But it, it's also good for people later on in general, uh, I've been told, that they can, if they, if they couldn't make the live show, then they just listen to it while they paint. And it's a little podcasty. I mean, there's very rarely much visually going on here other than that. Um, every once in a while I have a, like a cool thing, like you could buy some cool t-shirts um, and you could go to this URL over here. T-shirts look like, um, that's one of the cool ones. I got to wear that one during uh, Adepticon and then that one and that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in shirts, there you go. So that's, otherwise visually there's not a ton going on. Once in a while I look at stuff on the web, um, every once in a while, that's about it. Yeah. Used to have a second camera and used to mess with that, but there's not even really that much going on that way these days. It's predominantly more answering questions, which I enjoy. Um, and Lord knows I can talk for however long is necessary. <clears throat> All right. Roman asks, what does your wife think about the hobby? Um, she has her own hobbies. She's a musician, hence the, uh, you know, uh, Nick Romando back there. That's a cello case, by the way. Um, and uh, so she's a musician, so she does that. She actually, just before the show started, I happened to just glance at Nick there and realize that his eyes weren't on. Um, so I had to go find them. They were up on top of the shelf thing up here and stick them on real quick. Because um, she played in a symphony recently and she generally takes the eyes off before she goes to the symphony. Not because she doesn't want other people to make fun of her for having weird googly eyes on her, but she just doesn't want to lose the googly eyes at the symphony. So um, anyway, so she's got that and she's also a knitter. And right now... If I had to guess, she's upstairs right now playing Civilization VI on the PC. Um, so she's big into strategy games like that. So 
yeah, she doesn't have a problem with it, honestly. Um, we don't have any kids. We have four cats, but as I've said many times before, none of them are going to college. So um, we just kind of, uh, yeah, you know, we, we have our hobbies and we do our thing and, and it's cool. Um, I'm grateful that I'm able to do this uh, and, and not just this craziness as well, which she tolerates a bit more. Um, eventually, this is going to move into the basement. I'm in the dining room right now. That part, she's a little... She would prefer if that was not the case anymore, but it takes some work and I have to get an electrician to run some, it's a whole thing down in the basement. But eventually we will no longer be here in the dining room and instead we will be in a basement. I got to itch, sorry. Um, so uh, when that day comes, then I may just throw up a green screen and just put this background back there so it looks like I'm still in the dining room, but I won't be. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, no, it's I'm, I'm fortunate to have a, a wife that we both get along on in in that way and you know like she likes to watch sports she's into football and hockey and I don't care for either of them so you know sometimes she monopolizes the TV with that kind of stuff and I go do other things and it's pretty cool so yeah um dwarven dad says your soothing voice makes for a great background noise I've I've been told that before and I appreciate it thank you very much <clears throat> Useful G says, I think that informal shot with the headphones looks really cool. Well, I'm going to give you a little secret. It wasn't informal. I had a uh, friend. Uh, she's a, a professional photographer. So I paid her to come and shoot both of these pictures on the same day. So we started at my studio here and shot that. And then um, and then we went to uh, this bar called the Reptile Palace in town that's owned by two, two good friends of mine. And um, this is the men's bathroom. And so I was making it look like you can't really tell, but um, I'm holding actually a Primaris Ancient on one of those uh, GW, uh, I'm trying, it, one of those GW um, hobby holder things. And I've got a can of black um, Krylon camo, and I'm going to prime him there. That's why I'm wearing the gloves. Um, but it, that part, it's kind of hard to see, but still, it's a cool. Um, shot. I wanted it to look like a punk rock kind of super high contrast black and white kind of picture. So I did that. Uh, but like I said, this image kind of came, kind of came first. Um, and so I want to, in the future with new t-shirt designs, maybe do some more of this type of stuff, have some like decent looking photography. Eventually, I'm hoping that the t-shirt shop will start allowing everybody to be able to put in custom photos like right now the t-shirt shop that i use which is called teespring when you upload a design they just automatically put it on a little shirt silhouette and go here's your design but if you're somebody famous like if you're like the philip defranco show who uses or it, up until just recently used teespring um you could actually go out and take a picture of a model or something wearing the shirt and then that would be the thing that you would see on the page and then there would be a second picture where you would actually just see the little computer generated version of the, of, you know, on the silhouette. Um, but currently only fancy people can do that, not people like myself. So hopefully eventually they will fix the website so you, we can upload our own pictures if we want to, but they haven't done it yet. So, um, but I'm still taking them because they'll end up eventually on a website or something somewhere or whatever. And sometimes they'll just end up uh, like here, which is also a lot of fun. So, um, Again, if you want to look at uh, t-shirts, um, including that one and other ones as well, just uh, bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y slash Merch Bunker, and then you can um, support the channel and, 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 and get a cool shirt. So <clears throat> there you go. Pete says, heck, I'm late to my first time watching this live. Hello from Scotland. Well, it's, it's okay, Pete. Don't worry about it. You can watch the first hour and four minutes on afterwards. It'll be a little weird, but you'll be fine. Um, let's see. Nicodemus Bain says, cats these days not going to college, won't look for a job, won't clean their rooms. They certainly don't clean their rooms, I'll tell you that, that's for sure. Um, there was one, one of the cats I thought, man, I might go to tech, but no, nah, no, I don't think so. So, uh, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're pretty much, uh, they're pretty much staying around the house, which is fine. We have one that sometimes we let, we don't let Diesel outside. We take Diesel outside with a harness. Um, and then he just basically chews on grass and, and rolls around in the driveway. That's pretty much about it. Uh, but we do not let them outside to run around and stuff like that because I am very sure that they would get run over by cars. Um, and I don't want that. So, 
Uh, Uncle Adam, what do you think about Kill Team Arena? Um, it is not my particular kettle of fish. It's because it's aimed predominantly towards competitive play. Uh, I think it's it's smartly done as far as that's concerned because the boards are very two-dimensional because the three-dimensionality I can see absolutely slowing down competitive play because there's a lot of like, okay, I can see that in guy's entire body so you don't get covered. Well, no, I don't think that's true. Yeah, no, you can't, no, and back and forth, back and forth. Whereas when you're playing on a two-dimensional board, like with one of those like laser pointers that makes like a line, you can just be like, yep, and then both, it's really easy for both people to go, yeah, totally, you can, yeah. And it's there's no fighting back and forth on it. So that kind of stuff helps to streamline competitive play. Um, the fact that the boards, when you set them up and you follow the instructions on the uh, scenarios, are all mirrored. So I, my half of the board is identical to your half of the board. So there's none of this like, well, but I got this cool higher spot. So I'm going to put my sniper up here or my blight launcher. I've done that myself a bunch of times. Um, and, you know, and then that helps a bunch. Whereas if the other guy doesn't get that side, then they don't have that necessarily same bonus. In this situation, everything's equal. You know, so... Um, Again, like it makes sense that way, and I think that that's kind of for the competitive folks. That's cool. Me not being a competitive player and really enjoying the terrain and three dimensionality and all that kind of stuff. That for me, it, it's not particularly super interesting to me. But I'm glad that they've done it for the people who are interested in it. I think it's a good addition. Um, uh, I think there's four boards in there because there's two double sided ones, so that's also kind of nice. Gives you lots of options. Um, yeah, it, it's not a bad. I mean, it's it's a good thing. It's just not my area of interest particularly so uh let me see here what else have we got torch says i gotta go have breakfast with my in-laws i'll speak with you all later thanks uncle adam and matt have a great sunday all we'll have a good breakfast uh dave says would you buy and play emperor's children if a new range was released with a new codex um hmm, i kind of yeah well I'm kind of a big fan of pretty much everything but Slanesh. Uh, and I'm not even 100%. Is, is Emperor's Children Slanesh? I think it is. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think it is. Like, I like Black Legion. I like the visual look to it. I like Abaddon. I picked up the new Abaddon. I haven't been able to put them together yet. Um, what else? I like Death Guard, obviously, because Nurgle are pretty, pretty, pretty awesome, especially the new ones. Are, the new models are amazing. Um, and I even like, uh, what's his name there? Uh, Korn. So I guess I'm a big fan of Korn, Nurgle, and regular, like, Black Legion kind of, you know. Black Legion, they're just, like, straight up, uh, middle of the road. I don't know. Um, I like those, but I've never been a big Slanesh or Zinch fan. That being said, I do eventually want to make a... Thousand Sons kill team. I just don't want any Zangors in it because I don't like. I don't just don't like the look of them. So it's probably a stupid idea to make a, an army or a, a, a kill team of only uh, Rubric Marines. But that's what I'm going to end up doing. I just don't like the look of the Zangors, so I'm not going to take any. Same with um, Poxwalkers. I probably I may eventually take some Poxwalkers, but it will be way down the road. I did not start with Poxwalkers because um, again, I just don't like their dumb faces. Maybe I could resculpt their faces with my new silicone pokey tools. That'd be kind of fun. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> let me see here. I'm f currently finished the priming of Shadow Spear box. These models will be awesome. I've seen some really good painted stuff already, um, actually, from a friend of mine. Um, he's done some really nice work with the guys from that box. Uh, he's a local guy here in town. Um, yeah, definitely. They're very cool. I'm looking forward to getting mine done, or getting mine built and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let me see here. People talking about... What do we got here? Uh, JP Got Rocket says the Renaissance charges, charges $25, $25 for Brecky, a.k.a. breakfast. Was it 25 I thought it was only 20 Because we went actually nearly... Well, we went a bunch. Me and my friend Eric, who we were rooming together at Adepticon. We went to that breakfast buffet at Sam and Harry's, I think the place was called. Um, yeah, and it was 20 bucks a person, but it was all you could eat, like, whatever you wanted. Like, they would make you omelets and waffles and pancakes and 
Uh, they had these amazing breakfast potatoes that were spectacular. I wish I could get more of those now. They were awesome. Um, they had all kinds of donuts and fresh fruit and all kinds of jazz. Obviously, it was all the coffee and orange juice and whatever. So that was actually pretty good. Like we, so we went hard on breakfast. You know what I mean? We spent money on breakfast, but then the rest of the day we predominantly just ate like granola bars and we brought sandwiches and meat and some cheese which we kept in the fridge in the room so we pretty much didn't spend money on food much at dinner time or lunch we just spent money at breakfast I, they say that it's the most important meal of the day so you know um but yeah that's that's if the one downside to adepticon where it's currently located is that there's no restaurants that are particularly in walking distance. The old place, when it was in Lombard, Illinois, if you walked, it was not a super short walk, but it was still, it was not that far. It was, I don't know, a quarter of a mile, maybe half a mile to a mall. And then the mall had a food court, so you had all kinds of things to choose from. I mean, nothing great, you know, but you know, it was like a Sabaro and a Sakura and I don't know, some other places, maybe a Subway. Um, but at least you had some choices and you could do that, you know, have a quick lunch or whatever and, and head back. Now the new place um, is difficult. Like there's just not much around it at all. Um, there's some places, but you kind of have to take like a long walk and you have to sometimes walk, not across the highway, but it, um, that's problematic. So if you don't mind taking an Uber or something like that, a Lyft, I prefer Lyft. Uh, with a couple of friends and you because here's the deal you don't want to get in your car and then drive to a restaurant and then come back because then your parking spot will be gone one of the biggest problems right now with adepticon is the parking a lot of people want to come there and many of them seem to come by themselves and i think some people bring two cars i don't even know how that works <coughs> but yeah so parking is a problem um now they did this year add uh, a, a shuttle service to another parking lot, which was farther away, so you could take the shuttle and park someplace else and take the shuttle back. But I think it ended at uh, 10 o'clock or some, at some point, so it, yeah, I don't know how well it would work for that kind of thing. If you were going to go and decide to eat off-site, then you could do that. Um, but there are two, there's a, there's two, there's a bar and that has pretty good food and then also that Sam and Harry's that also has pretty good food. And it's not that expensive in my opinion. Um, like I've been to conventions where it's been way worse. There's also convention food too. Like there's a couple little like kiosks and stuff like that where they're selling, frankly, pretty expensive slices of pizza and stuff like that. But it's just the same. It, you know, go to Gen Con and you pay six dollars for a hot dog. It's the same kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I the other thing is for me personally, when you're at Adepticon, I don't want to leave Adepticon for three hours and go eat at a restaurant with a whole bunch of people because then I'll be gone from Adepticon for three hours. Like, I want, like, I'll go up, like, that's the thing. Like, dinner time, I go upstairs, I eat some stuff real quick, uh, refill my my beverage uh, container, and then go back out and talk to more people and go see more things and stuff like that. Um, you know, getting on a shuttle bus or whatever and then going to some, like, big restaurant and sitting there for three or four hours and stuff, to me, I don't know, it's just not my thing. Some people like to do it because that's the way that they get to see the people they don't get to see in person too frequently. But I, you know, for me, it's more of a I like to be there on in the place doing things more. So that's where I'm at. Uh, Zachary, hey Uncle Adam, how do you feel? How do you deal with that guy at your FLGS like Power Gamers? They've been putting a damper on my enjoyment. I, I don't play them anymore. It's just straight up. Um, I did a video about that guy actually sometime this year, so it's not that old. Um, but yeah, I just don't play them anymore. If, if there's a person that I've played in the past and I, and I found out, oh, okay. And some of you can even tell before you play them and just be like, mm, no, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Um, I just don't. I mean, it's a bummer in that you know now you've got one less person to play against, but I find that the stress... I'd rather have I'd rather have less stress than more games in some situations. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where that's at. Um, Wargaming Lobby says I think there's a potbelly close to Adepticon. Uh, it's sort of there. Yeah, yeah. It's not super super close, but it's close-ish. Uh, I do remember one of the first years that we went to the new Adepticon location where it is now. Me and Eric did walk there. 
but I couldn't tell you where it is now. Like it was like we like followed on our fo- on my phone and just like we were walking like through parking lots and over grass and just like probably trespassed somewhere on some I don't know because it's kind of like an industrial park area out there to some degree. And uh, then we did eventually find it, but it was far away. Um, Uh, Kelly says that the current hotel has a saltwater pool and a hot tub. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was a saltwater pool. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I've never swum there. Swum? Swam? I've never done that while I've been there. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a great hotel. I love the hotel. Don't get me wrong. Um, and they are talking about expanding the parking in some fashion. Maybe making a parking ramp. That'd be pretty cool. Um, and I was also told by one of the staff that they're also looking at expanding like the main hall but that will take time like you know that's not something you do over a weekend you know um it's not like you know painting your dining room or something like that so yeah legionnaires says that time lost versus money lost yeah i get that definitely Emily said, we only left once to go to that Asian Chipotle place. That When you posted pictures, actually, Emily, that did look pretty awesome. Uh, I'll have to look up the name, but it was amazing. Five-minute shuttle each way. We didn't wait more than five minutes total. Uh, all we paid for was ride, for the ride was a tip. Well, that's, that's a pretty good deal. Like, yeah, they're definitely working to get it so that the shuttle service is better so that people don't have to park right there and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and, and that's cool. And the, the pictures that I remember used to showing of the Asian Chipotle place did look pretty damn good. Plus, they also had in the lobby upstairs on the second floor, didn't they have like a weird thing? Not a weird thing, but they had a thing going on, a different thing going on every night. Like there was one night it was burrito bowls and another night it was like a something going on. And so, yeah, like they're, they're, they're working to get other ways for you to eat there and not just sit in your room and munch on granola bars, which is mostly what I do. But yeah. Um, Let's see here. Adam, do you have any good resources on STL files for 3D printed terrain? Um, I mean, there's Thingiverse, which is predominantly free. If you're interested in paying a bit of money, there are plenty of companies that do it that do really well. Uh, Corvus, uh, with a C, the Corvus um, printable terrain, or Corvus game terrain, Corvus something. I forget the last parts of the name, but Corvus does some really nice stuff. Uh, Imperial terrain is another really nice set of STL files. Predominantly a little bit more Star Wars-y. So if you're playing Legion, like they're uh, right on board with that, but they they have other stuff as well that that can work. Um, There's a company called Printable Scenery that does good work as well. So uh, Fat Dragon Games has been doing a bunch if you're looking a little bit more towards like RPG tile kind of like almost like that Dwarven Forge stuff if you want to print your own. They do good work. There's plenty of companies out there that do it, but you end up paying. But it's like, oh, maybe you're going to pay five bucks for this SDL. Well, now you can print as many of them as you want. You know what I mean? So it's not the end of the world. But if you're looking only for free stuff, that's a lot harder. Um, Thingiverse is the best place to find that stuff that I know of. But again, you get what you pay for to some degree. So there's that. Um, let me see here Calvin says hey Adam the significant other got into painting more she chose Black Legion traitor well and, and, and playing more we learned uh, Battle or Blackstone Fortress and Shadespire would Kill Team be a good next step I have been in wargaming for a while yeah I think that if you've done Blackstone Fortress and Shadespire I think if you're interested in being able to use maybe some of that Black Legion and things like that in Kill Teams then definitely Kill Team is the way to go um I think that's the next kind of logic, logical step. If you wanted to head all the way to 40k, you wouldn't have to necessarily because that's getting into much larger armies and a much larger uh, collection. Um, but yeah, Kill Team is a great kind of stepping stone to the next thing. And literally all you need is you buy the book. I think it costs 40 bucks. Um, if you can't find it at your local shop, your local shop should be able to order it. Uh, if you're into ebook type things, they do sell it on like Apple Play or no Apple iBooks and Google Play, whatever it is. Um, and so that's you know that's they don't run out of those. So yeah, it's um it's pretty good stuff. It's a great game. I really enjoy Kill Team. That's honestly that's that's the game that I'm playing the most these days. So 
Uh, let me see here. Clayton says, "I never want to miss an Adapticon again." It is. It is a pretty good. Uh, it's a very good show. John Jay says, "No food trucks at Adapticon." No, they don't do that. Partially because I think it's March, and it's cold. So maybe there's that. Uh, I don't know why they don't. You'd think they would, but I don't, I don't know. Like um, Nova, Nova Open, that's food trucks galore. So that's a, but it's also that see the downside at least last year at Nova was like yeah I want to go outside by the food truck but it's 98 degrees, and I don't want to stand in line for pizza at 98 degrees. So yeah, that's problem problematic. Um. Let me see, what else have we got? J Solo Arts says, I just visited Star Wars Celebration, and hands down, Adepticon is a much better convention. So much more accessible. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I, I've got a bunch of friends that are at Celebration, because uh, it's in Chicago, so it's not too far away from us. It's about a three-hour drive from where I live. And um, I, I just... I like Star Wars. I like Star Wars a good deal. Um, I saw the original movie um, as a kid. My mom took me back in 77 or 78 or whatever the hell it was. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, that being said, I don't see myself ever going to one of those celebration things because it's the same reason I don't go to like comic conventions. The reason I love gaming conventions is because it's got a lot of the same stuff that, say, a celebration might have and comic conventions have. It's got vendor areas, it's got seminars and things like that, but then I can also play games. I can do demos, I can play in gaming events, narrative stuff. I mean, technically I could play in competitive events, but I'm generally not going to do that, but it's available. For me, like, going to a convention, if there's not any games there, I'd be like, I would walk around and go through the vendor area and be like, okay, I'm all done now. And then I, I don't know. I don't know what else would to do. Maybe, and I'm, I don't want to sit in line for three hours to watch a seminar or a big panel, that's just not interesting to me. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm just saying, for me, that wouldn't be my what I would like to spend my time doing. Whereas Adepticon, it's... I think you're right about it being accessible because it is... There's just... You, you're, you're staying there in the hotel as well and just kind of... if you And you don't have to be. You can also be staying in one of the hotels across. But you come in and you're there and you're just hanging out and doing stuff and having a good time. Um... It seems less like a shopping trip. You'll do some shopping probably, but it seems less like a shopping trip. Whereas I've found um, one of these days I want to go to a comic convention because I want to get some sketches done. And then that way I will have like a goal and I'll look around at some stuff and whatever and all that jazz. But then it probably won't be like a two day thing. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, that's just my own personal opinion. Where are we at? Okay. Uh, Charlie says, have you talked about old games like Car Wars and Gaslands before? Do you find that they are making a resurgence, as I'm hearing? I'm making cars and scenery right now. Well, Gaslands is not an old game. Gaslands is relatively new. Um, it's, yeah, Gaslands is from it's maybe two years old, maybe three, but I think two years old, uh, from Osprey. Car Wars, on the other hand, that is an old game. Yeah, like I was playing that back in college in the early 90s, and it had been... I think it might have come out in the late 70s, honestly. Um, I honestly, personally believe that the reason that Car Wars is finally coming back is because Gaslands has been so popular. Um, so in 2012 or 11, one of the two, Steve Jackson Games did their first Kickstarter, and it was for Ogre, which was one of Steve's earliest games. And the, the whole concept of Ogre is that it's a sci-fi like ground battle game and you have one force that is made up of hover tanks and regular tanks and troops and all kinds of stuff and they've got tactical nukes and all kinds of jazz and you've got tons of units and then the other player has one tank but it is called an ogre and it is the size of a city block and there's nobody inside it's an AI cybernetically run tank um, in the fluff they have these humongous giant factories that spend tons and tons and tons and tons of time and they build a giant honking ogre tank which then rolls out of the factory and then just drives until it hits the ocean and then drives underneath the ocean and then comes up in the country that they're attacking and then just gets into trouble like that's they don't they don't drop it by a helicopter it's massive so it's it's a game where you have these two forces that are supposed to be equal, except one is only one unit and the other one is 20, you know, or, or more. Um, 
So they did this giant Kickstarter to make this giant version of the game because um, the old game was just little hex chips or it was a hex map with little square chips and stuff like that. They wanted to make a bigger version. It's not plastic miniatures, but it's like um, thick chipboard that's printed on both sides and slotted together like the like a normal um, ogre in the new game when you put it together is like seriously like three inches, four inches long. So um, very it's very cool. But one of the stretch goals for that game back then in 2012, if they got if they made it like Steve Jackson didn't really at the time he didn't really know what Kickstarter was, and he was working on an idea for a new version of Ogre, and people were like, "You should use this new thing called Kickstarter." And he's like, "Ah, I don't know." So they I think the original goal was to raise thirty thousand dollars. When they ended it, they raised just shy of a million, like nine hundred and twenty something thousand dollars. Well, the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar stretch goal when they got to that point was like, okay, if we hit seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, then we will bring back Car Wars, which made me super excited. So they hit that stretch goal. They went beyond that stretch goal. Time marched on, years and years and years, and I was not seeing this Kickstarter that had been promised happening for Car Wars, and I was getting kind of surly about it. But then Gaslands came out, and I'm like, okay, well, Gaslands is very cool. I like that game. Great. I don't have to worry about Car Wars anymore. Okay, cool. And I do honestly think because of how popular Gaslands has been, I think that's what spurred, to some degree, them to go, oh gosh, we should probably do something for Car Wars again. Because we said we were gonna, and now these guys are kind of eating our lunch on that, and that's money that we're leaving on the table. I think I may have mixed my metaphors there, but you, you kind of get what I'm saying. So, yeah, that's... um. I don't know. I, I like I said earlier in the show, it's it comes across to me it's a very different game than it used to be because it used to be a lot of paperwork, a lot of book work, a lot of math, um, and now it is much more like X Wing, like Star Wars X Wing, uh, as far as in play style. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I know that the oldsters will not dig it, for the most part. Many of them will not because they'll be like, "In my day, you did." And it's not. It's not like that. It's nothing like that. Um, the one thing that me as an oldster is going to miss, I think, is um, they used to make a quarterly magazine that you could buy called Auto Duel Quarterly. And uh, in it, there would be stories and there would be all kinds of stuff. But then there would be these ads, these fake ads that they would make for new devices and weapons and stuff to put on your car. And the thing was, at the very bottom of the ad, in very small type, would be the actual in-game stats. So that's how they added new things to the game, is they would just be like, oh, here's an ad for it. And then if you had that magazine, you could be like, oh, cool, I've got this new kind of like oil dropper for getting, make, causing oil slicks or whatever. And this is like how much it costs in-game to, 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 to buy for your car, and these are the stats, and all, it's all the information. Then you could build, when you were building your vehicles, you could do that. The new way that you build your vehicles is by using cards. So I think that you're going to end up having to get those cards from somewhere as opposed to just having it being an ad in a magazine, you know? So um, I don't know. That's that's For me, That's it's a little tiny thing, but it is a little bit of a bummer. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I think the thing that's very interesting is that the, the visual aesthetic that they've always had for Car Wars has literally come around again. So, like, they used to always, back in the 70s and 80s, use this kind of visual aesthetic, which now we refer to as Synthwave. If you if you just do, like, a Google search for Synthwave, you'll see, like, what I'm talking about. It's a lot of, like, Tron grids going off into the, you know, and, like, a lot of, like, magenta and turquoise and, 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 and crazy, like, metallic uh, fades on the letters and stuff like that. Stuff that looks, like, totally kind of weird in 80s, but kind of, yeah. So Synthwave is getting popular again. You're seeing it more and more. And I think they've just leaned into it, maybe not even intentionally. I think they may have just never changed the art style and it's just come around to be popular again. So we'll see how that works out. But um, yeah. So long story short, uh, Gaslands is a very cool game and it's like 20 bucks and you buy some Matchbox cars and you go to town. This game will cost more, but it will come with the plastic cars you need. You still paint them, but you won't have to like build your own cars and glue little guns onto Matchbox cars and all that kind of jazz. Um, but it'll also come with all the cards and all the things and all the dice and all that jazz. So that's kind of cool because the one downside to Gaslands is that you buy the book, but then if you want like cool dice, you got to go on Etsy and look for somebody who's making the cool dice, you know, or whatever. And if you want the cool like acrylic or cardboard even or whatever types of like the turning rulers and jazz, well, you end up having to go and look for those on some craft site or something like that or make your own. Um, 
all this stuff will come with um, Car Wars, but it'll be like again, it's they said it's going to be a Kickstarter. Sometimes in sometime in 2019, they're going to launch the Kickstarter. So we'll see how that works out. Um, Harold Allen says, Adam, first time on the show. Do you chat with other YouTubers? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, hung out a little bit with um, uh, Scott, uh, the, the Miniac, at Adepticon. Talked with him. Um, I was actually talking to Josh and Steve from Mini Wargaming during Adepticon. Uh, Cullen, I also talked to a little bit there. Um, I saw Mini Wargame Matt, but I didn't get a chance to chat with him. Um, Dave wasn't there this year, but I was actually chatting with Dave on online last night. We were talking about some stuff. Um, who else? YouTubers. Um, hmm. Oh, I talked to Mel, the Terrain Tutor, uh, at Adepticon. That was the first time we had physically met, but we chatted online and before about other stuff. Um, gosh, who else do I chat with? And that's, I mean, that's about it right now that I can think of. I mean, there's probably others, but I can't, uh, I'm having a bit of a blank. But yeah, <clears throat> I do talk to some here and there. Um, people who used to do more YouTubing but don't as much anymore. Um, you know, like uh, Michelle Olson, uh, Oasis Rising was her channel. It still is, but she doesn't post on it very much anymore. I bumped into her at Adepticon a couple of times. Um, I talked to Chung from the Wargamers Consortium at LVO. I hadn't seen him in quite some time, and uh, so yeah, you know that's 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 definitely a thing. Um, John Ashley Smith says I got to play a sixty can game of Gaslands last night. There was a five car chain reaction explosion. What a blast! Literally, what a blast! Nice. Yeah, that's that was a lot of that. That game has got a lot of cool stuff going on, and it does have a tendency to go south and there's a lot of explosions um yeah jp got rocket says at least five years late on car wars lol uh yes that's kind of the case so we'll see how that yeah i'm looking forward to it because like i said i went into it going well i don't know and i started looking at it and going ah oh, geez but when i actually sat down i got to play a game i got to play a game i didn't get to give, be a play in the first session at 10 but i got to play in the second session on saturday at noon and uh after kind of like explained it and i got to start playing it I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. It's, like I said, if you've played X-Wing, you're going to be like, I see where this is going, and I think that that will be good for getting new people into Car Wars. I don't think that the older folks are going to dig it. Like, there were a couple of guys there that were older than me that were playing it, and I could tell that they were a little, hmm, this is not like it used to be, and I get that. Um, but there were also some that were like, okay, this is not like it used to be, but it goes a lot faster. I don't have to do any math. I don't, have to, I don't have to keep, like, an entire sheet full of, like, stats and information. I just have this, you know, dial in front of me, and I just keep track of everything that way, which I think was smart. The The dial is well-designed, I think. So, yeah, it's definitely going to be kind of cool. VJ Morph says, I've been doing loads of Synthwave graphics for clients at the moment. It's very hot look right now in motion graphics. Yeah, exactly. And, like, if you look at, um, like, if, well... Uh, like the, the banner that I took a picture of. Let's see if I can find it real quick here. Um, Instagram. Um, this one. Like that is very, that's got a lot of, you know, uh, this synthwave kind of stuff going on to it. And um, yeah, it'll be... It'll be interesting to see how much, whether they lean into it a little bit more. But Car Wars has always had that sort of look to it, so yeah. But um, yeah, so here they were playing on three foot by three foot, like neoprene mats. And you can see the dials. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, you can. Okay. So you can see these are the dials that they have that keep track of your speed in the middle and your power plant and your tires and then your armor on four sides. And then these things in the front... Those are the front weapons, or some, they don't all have to be weapons. Sometimes they're just a device or things like that. Um, one's on the left, one's in the back. And then over to this side over here, then that's where you keep your gunners and, and driver and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, and so these are the turn rulers. So it's not, there's only one. You don't have to, it's not like, like X-Wing where you've got like a whole handful of these rulers. You just have this one ruler, and that's how you go straight. And if you want to turn, you basically move the car up 
and then you kind of turn it over this curvy bit and then depending on how far you turn it depends on how many dice you have to roll. If you're moving it, let's say, speed three, then you have to throw three yellow dice to make a maneuver. But then if it's just a little bit of a bend here, you see that green area, then you also have to throw a green die. But if you go yellow, now you have to throw the green die and also another yellow die. And then there's two red ones. So if you do like a 90 degree turn, let's say at, 20, at, at speed two, you have to roll two yellows, you have to roll a green, another yellow, and two reds. And every time you get the shield with the swervy S in the middle, that's bad. So it's kind of, yeah, it's the more you push your luck, the more likely you are going to wipe out. So, and you can see, yeah, this is how the person, so you would move you know, and slide up on these things. And these plastic bases that the cars are on, they are hollow underneath. So when you move up and then want to turn, you just kind of move up till the back of the piece is right at this line. And then you can just kind of curve it, you know, however you need to do it. And that, that's kind of how the way it works. It's kind of right. The bases remind me a little bit of Star Wars Armada in that they're kind of raised up and they have little pieces that stick down to the table, but you can get stuff underneath them. That's kind of what they're doing there. So, yeah. Um, anyway, that's those are some quick pictures of the stuff from there. And here's some quick pictures from uh, yesterday's shoot with Sam. Um, got a big old bottle of Windex there because he washed the windows after we were done. That's not true. He didn't actually do that. Um, uh, action shot. Got a little bit of a motion blur there on the, on the airbrush. Doing some, uh, like I said, some cavalry folks. And there's a close-up of the base as it's drying, which took some time. So, um, yeah, you'll probably see the one of those videos coming out actually on Friday. Um, I'm going to get all my windows back in. <clears throat> all right. Let's see here. Um, Mike Eisenberg says, Speaking of mini wargaming, any idea what's going on with their painting videos? Subscribe to their channel for painting videos, but I haven't seen one in months. Their normal YouTube channel is mostly bat reps and not really painting uh, ch uh, stuff. If you want to see the painting stuff generally, then you need to become a vault member because most of the painting tutorials are done in the vault and a vault membership costs uh, would be 35 bucks a year or something like that. But that's, that's, that's best I know. I could be wrong on that, but that's probably the case. Uh, Devin Jones says, Wargamer Girl, you've mentioned talk to, talking to her in person. But, oh, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah, no, um, forgot about that. Yes, uh, she and her husband were at Adepticon, and I talked to both of them for a while. Um, yeah, we talk from time to time. We used to do a, a live show together, her and I and Chris from Mini Wargaming. Years ago on her channel used to do, we called it Cinematic Wargaming or something like that, or Cinematic Wargamers, Cinematic Wargamers. And we would get together and talk about movies, and... Um, it did not like nobody we nobody watched because we didn't generally follow a proper theme i think uh, we also didn't always do it on the right like night or whatever oh geez i'm still doing the sorry uh that's what i want to do um yeah so it, but you know we had fun we had a good time it was mainly just a reason for her and me and uh, and chris to sit and chat about movies because we had a, a good time with it <clears throat> Ross Wolf says, with Gaslands being relatively popular and Steve Jackson bringing out the new edition of Car Wars, do you think there might be a chance that GW will bring out a new edition of Dark Future? Um, not that I know of. There, I know that there was a Dark Future video game that was in development. I don't know if it ever came out, but I remember seeing a video for it a year or two ago and going, oh, cool, Dark Future video game, that's neat. I don't know if it ever actually did get released, but I don't know if they're going to bother to... It's possible, but I, I, I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Uh, J Solo Arts says, Use the Rust-Oleum Frosted Grass... Frosted Grass? Frosted Glass Spray for Matt Varnish. 55 degrees, 40% humidity, and it worked very well. I was pleased. Well, that's cool. I... Um, I've started using the AK Interactive Ultra Matte Varnish and firing it through my airbrush, and that stuff is amazing. But I do want to compare it to Dull Coat, which I don't think is as good as it used to be. I think they changed the formula, and I also want to compare it to that Rust Oleum stuff and uh, and like check that out. Like I, I just want to do a video where I just take like three models that are identical and gloss them all, and then spray them all with the three different things and see what happens. 
uh, and you know compare and contrast. So that's coming. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, John Ashley Smith says there are at least three supplements on ga uh, four gas lands on the website that add new weapons, sp sponsors, perks, and scenarios you can download for free. That's also very cool. I'm glad they're doing that. Um, let me see here. What else have we got? Wargaming Lobby says tomorrow is a working day. Need sleep. You guys have a great day. See you all in two weeks. Uh, absolutely. Good to see you. Thanks for, for checking in from um, Australia. Um, VJ Morph says, "Seems to me that Car Wars will struggle against Gaslands if it's a smaller scale than Matchbox." Uh, yeah, it might. I mean, there. I think there are going to be people that like it because the cars are going to come. Like, you don't have to go to your grocery store and find cars and glue little guns to them and spray paint them and all that kind of jazz. There are people who are just like, I just want to paint the cars and go. There are other people who probably won't paint the cars at all. They're not pre-painted like um, X-wing. That's one big difference. Is they're not pre-paints. Um, and it is a slightly smaller scale, not a ton smaller, but um, you can also then much more easily play like on a three foot by three foot. Whereas I think Gaslands four foot by four foot's a little bit better for that, I think, or even bigger if you're playing with a bunch more people. If you're just playing two on two or one on one, it's not too bad. But like at um, TMX last year, uh, the noob painter brought a bigger mat and and went to town that way. So or no, actually he didn't bring a mat. I brought him a mat. Because he didn't, he he was coming on the plane and he couldn't bring a mat, so um, I should reach out to him. Because he was talking about trying to bring a mat, and I've got mats that I could bring, but I'll I don't think he's on right now, but I'll I'll reach out to him. <clears throat> uh, J Solo Art says, "What was the Windex for?" I think he uses it to Sam uses Windex to maybe clean his airbrush. Well, he also sometimes thins paint with it too. Um, yeah. Uh, C.E. Faltum says, first time chatting here. I hope to run some demos, pick up games for Blood and Plunder at TMX. First time there this year. Well, good. Glad to hear it. Um, you should uh, definitely, if you go to the TMX website, uh, which is tabletopmeans.org slash TMX, if you go there, you can register to run some events, and then I can put them in the listing. There's just a simple form you fill out on the thing, and then I can put them in the listing, and then other people will know about it, and then we can kind of go from there. So if you're interested in coming to TMX and you're interested in running some games, definitely go onto the website uh, and post your stuff, and I will put it in there um, so that people can, can find out about what's going to be running at the convention before they show up. So um, I'm going to start pushing it... Actually, in the next week or so, I'm going to start pushing harder and probably doing more posts about it and getting people kind of, you know, jazzed for it. Um, again, it's a small convention. Like last year, there was like 65 people there. But it's it's kind of cool. It's nice. It's it's chill, as the kids say. Um, so definitely looking forward to it. VJ Morph says, hey, Adam, I'm going to use your orc painting recipe from Shadespire to do my orc blitz bowl team. We'll show it off at TMX. Nice. Yeah, I, that's, I think that's a good... If the orcs that you're painting have got a decent amount of metal on them in any fashion, I think it's better to prime them black, dry brush the heck out of them with silver, and then paint the skin, versus priming the skin and then having to paint the armor separately. I think it's just faster, frankly, because it's just, you know... Again, if they're not wearing metal armor, like if they're more... Um, well, I forget what the Age of Sigmar ones where they're not really armored much. Savage Orcs, maybe? I think it's the Savage Orcs. Like, then that's a different story. But if they're, like, the more, like, Iron Skulls boys or whatever like that, and they've got a lot of metal, like, nailed onto them or whatever, then definitely I, I think that's a good, a good quick way to do it. <clears throat> um, Twisted Bishop said, Cinematic Wargamers was a great show. I was very sad to see it end. I think you're one of three folks who, who, who thought that. It was fun, you know, but it was we just didn't have a lot of people watching. Um, but it was a lot of fun just to basically sit and chat. Uh, let's see. What are your thoughts about Warhammer Underworlds? Greetings from Argentina. Um, I like Warhammer Underworlds. I like uh, Shadespire. I need to actually play some Night Haunt. I haven't, or Night Vault, whatever it's called. I haven't played any of that yet. I bought it. Uh, it's in a box. But I have not done that. I think there's a very good chance that my wife and I might start giving Underworlds a try because it's, I think, a good gateway game. Like I said, she's predominantly more of a board gamer in that way, and so I think that this would be a good sort of leap 
Like, I don't think she's ever going to paint, which is fine. I can paint stuff. Um, but she is, she has showed some interest in, you know, doing some miniature stuff. I mean, you know, it's, it's a big thing in, in, in both of our lives because I'm doing this and, and making videos and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff and traveling and all that jazz. So I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Found some great minis at Adepticon from Arena Rex. Wanted to get more, but they are sold out on their website. Do you know if they keep up production? Yeah, I mean, I th I've never heard about, like, Arena Rex stuff being super sold out. I suppose they may have had specific models that might have been, like, limited edition that sold out. I guess I could see that. But otherwise, yeah, I don't know. Um, let's see here. Hey, Warstein Studios is here. Windex is universal airbrush fluid. Clean, thin, whatever you need. See, I've never used it for my airbrush. I don't know why. I always just, well, I don't know. I use, it's because I'm a fancy lad. I use airbrush cleaner stuff that I bought years ago from a big, thick, honking bottle of it from some art supply place online. I forget what, but it's Iowata, like airbrush cleaner. But um, yeah, I should probably try the Windex. I always... The fact that it's blue, I'm just like, if you're going to thin stuff, isn't it going to make your stuff look a little blue? I don't know. I just, I mean, probably not, but it just seems to me like it will. Uh, VJ Morph says, uh, speaking of bringing things to TMX, I'm already bringing a fair bit of stuff. Adam, can you bring your Blitz Bowl set, please? Yes. You may need to remind me, but yes, I, I will. Um... So I noticed that many players, according to Frederick, have externals like hard plastic rulers, blast templates, etc. What externals for miniature wargaming do you find useful? What would you recommend? Hmm. Never heard them called the externals, but yeah. Um, I like uh, like movement templates or measuring templates. Like sometimes you don't want to have to pull out the tape measure to see if it's five inches or if it's if you, you know or if you're close enough are you within two inches to make sure you're in coherency well pulling out a big honking tape measure is sometimes a pain but having like a little gauge or or, or, or template is kind of nice um so i kind of like those i do i own a couple of those uh depending on the game i like little tokens sometimes that that's just helpful to remind you like for wounds and things like that like let's say he's a it's, it's a multiple wound character and it's taken it's a four wound character and it's taken two wounds. Well, then I'll put like a little die. I will usually have dice that are smaller than my normal dice that I'm playing with so I don't accidentally pick them up. I also like to have them to be a different color than my normal dice. So again, I don't, you know, go to take a bunch of shots and then take one of the dice by accident. So I have like a different die that I like to use to say this guy's got two wounds left or something like that. I do that a lot. Um, there are wound markers you can buy. Um, stuff like that, that's fine. Um, but I generally like to just use a die for that kind of stuff. But then other types of games, depending on the game, sometimes you're pinned in a game, sometimes you're suppressed, sometimes you're prone. Um, depends on the game. And having little markers to kind of remind you of those types of uh, situations, whatever those things might be, those conditions, I think is helpful. Just because sometimes if you don't have that, you forget. And then you like do something and you're like, oh, wait, that guy couldn't have done that. He was lying down. So he couldn't have even seen that guy because he was behind a wall or whatever. That kind of jazz. So, um, yes. Grimlock Steve says, I hope so. I was playing the new Battletech game yesterday and my head was mush after and it, it took so long. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I know they came up with a new version of it, and they were selling a ton of it at Adepticon, the new Battletech box. And the new models look great, but it still seems to be kind of roughly, from what I understand, it's kind of the same game. I keep wanting to try Alpha Strike, and they keep not producing it for reasons, so I don't know. It's very, it's very strange. Um... Trey Baker says there's clear Windex nowadays, methinks. No, that's true. That's very true. Um, let's see here. Uh, first time seeing the show says, I need an adult. Well, I'm glad to, to have you here. Glad to hear it. Devin Jones says, an external is like a laser line. I buy them from Harbor Freight. They are sold at, they're sold for chop shaws. Great for line of sight. Yeah, I've got one of those. It's like, a, I think it's from Army Painter. 
uh, and I like it quite a bit. Um, yeah, see, I guess I've never heard of that stuff referred to as um, uh, externals. Around here, for some reason, we refer to them as gamer aids. Like, it's just like, you know, little templates and tokens and laser pointers and stuff like that. Just aids with your gaming. So, yeah. Um, let me see. Simsy says, first time watcher, I was wondering if Sam Lenz is going to return back to the channel. I think he's an awesome painter. Would like to see more of him. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, he is. He uh, and I shot yesterday. Here's a picture of him. Uh, and the Windex we were just talking about. Um, and uh, there he is again. And he's working on some stuff with the airbrush. And that's a little guy on a horse. So yes, actually, it seems as if this Friday, um, the probably the Friday video coming up will be um, a new one from Sam. We filmed three yesterday, so we're not going to do... I probably won't do all three in a row, so I'll probably do one video that's upcoming Friday for him and then, of him, and then there'll be probably the next Friday after that will be one of mine, and then we'll kind of alternate like that. But yes, Sam is definitely uh, back, um, and we're doing some stuff. But if you like Sam, you should definitely go and follow him on Twitch, which is at twitch.tv slash samsonarts. Um, you can find him, if you just go to Twitch and just type in Sam Lenz, I'm pretty sure you're going to find him there too. But yeah, he generally streams Wednesdays and Thursdays, but sometimes other days. Sometimes Friday, sometimes Tuesday. Um, I think, that's right. But yeah, so, um, but Wednesdays and Thursdays are pretty standard, unless he's traveling. So, So yeah, there you go. Oh, and you already follow Sam on Twitch. Well, then you're good there too. Yeah, but he'll be back in the channel. Like I said, should be this up should be this upcoming Friday, unless something horrible happens. Like I, I, I haven't transferred the data over, but it looks like it should be fine. Um, BJ Morph says I downloaded the Alpha Strike rules and have a box set that they did a few years back. Going to have a game in the next few weeks. See, I'm just waiting for them to come up with the new set that they keep talking about and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yes, I've had some conversations with um, uh, some folks that I know who are closely attached with them, and I know that there that there's there's things going on. It's just slow, you know. John Ashley Smith says, We cooked up our own Battletech rules that's not headache-inducing by limiting the amount of shots to deal with heat and the straight damage capacity worked out very well for up to four players. See, that's the other thing I like, too, about tabletop wargaming, uh, is that you can just decide to change the rules. If you and your opponent and you and your friends or whatever just decide to house rule something or do that, like, that's, a, again, in comparison to video games, that's kind of hard to do. Like, you can, if you're on a server with people that you like... And people who are all like friends, you can decide like you're going to play a, you know, team deathmatch game, but you're only going to use knives. You've seen that kind of stuff before. You can do that, but you can't decide how knives work differently now. You know what I mean? Like you can't decide that knives, if knives are not a one sh one shot kill weapon in the game normally, you can't just decide. Well, let's say if you get stabbed once, you're dead. You you can't do that. Now, if you know how to write mods and stuff like that, you could write a mod for it and everything, admittedly, but most people don't know how to write mods. Um, whereas if you and I just decide, hey, if I hit you with this, it does this instead of what the rules say, then you can go, uh-huh, sure, we agree. And then there you go. Like that, you don't need to be a coder to be able to do that. You just need to be able to agree. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I like uh, tabletop games is because you can tweak things the way that you want very easily. So... Um, people talking a little bit about Battletech. I have an old Orion mech that I want to repaint. Should get to him soon. Yeah, I haven't painted a Battletech miniature in forever. Um, yeah, I those were some of the first models that I ever painted. Actually, were Battletech. I was using, I was using the old paints that I used to use on airplanes and cars when I was a kid, like those little square glass bottles of Tester enamels. And I got these uh, Battletech guys, and I'm like, oh, I, I'll use these. And, pfft, and it was not so awesome. Um, but yeah, no, I so I really haven't painted in a long, long time because of that. Uh, well, I mean, I, that and also the fact that I just haven't played Battletech so much either. Um, Kelly says, try Adeptus Titanicus. It is Battletech light. Great fun. I, I got a demo of Adeptus Titanicus at Valhalla last year from uh, a very nice gentleman named Mike from the UK. Um, 
and it for something it, the models were awesome the models were amazing and he painted them quite well uh, but for something it was just something about the game system that just didn't strike for me I don't know what it was I could see that it's popular I could I could look at it and go yes this was this is working well but sometimes there's just like a mechanic that you just don't like or there's just, just something almost intangible that I'm just not feeling it and so I was just like Meh. so I that's because I was thinking it's, I, what I did was I called my game shop before I played the demo to double check and say, hey, because he still had, my local game shop still had a, a copy of the big, whatever they call it, the Quartermasters, whatever the big box that they sold that they said right up front was going to be limited. He still had one of those in the store. It was like $290 or something. But it came with like a whole bunch of the models and the terrain and the whole shebang. And so I was like, do you still have that in stock? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, all right, I was just checking. So then I went and played the demo. And we had a, okay, I had, we had a good time because we, we, we like each other and we're, 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 we're fun. <laughs> but uh, I just didn't quite enjoy the game. And it wasn't that I lost. I don't remember if I did lose or not. It was just, there was, some of the mechanics just did not resonate for whatever reason. So then I called my, well, actually I texted uh, the, my, my friend who owns the game store. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get that. So you can, if someone comes in and wants to sell it, don't hold it for me. Or wants, wants to buy it, don't hold it for me. So yeah, I, uh, that I don't know. Uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, I'm glad it's doing well. I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there that like it, but for some reason, it just did not strike with me. Um, Slev says my favorite mech game was Ronin Duels. Shame it died horribly because it was awesome. I remember Ronin Duels. I bought a bunch of models actually just to use as other stuff. It was this crazy kind of mech combat game. If I remember correctly, a lot of the stuff was supposed to be modular and almost like magnetized. So you could swap out different weapons and different this and different that. Um, I never knew, I never even saw anybody play it. I just came across a bunch of the models and they were like super cheap at the local game shop um, years and years ago. And I picked some up and they've been still sitting in a drawer for a long time. I've used some parts here and there for other like uh, modifications to other games and things like that, you know, like bits basically, but I've never. I've never played it. Um, yeah. Um, Uncle Adam, did you get your copy of Hellboy board game Kickstarter yet? The box and the content in it is absurd. I haven't. Uh, that well, I mean, I guess it's possible it showed up yesterday. It was sent to work because uh, normally then there's somebody there. Whereas if I send it here to home, it's going to sit on the porch. So. Um, yeah, but I have not gotten the Kickstarter yet, but I should be getting it very soon, evidently. So maybe even this week. Uh, I did see they had a, uh, they had like a, a case, they had a cabinet at Adepticon that just like the entire cabinet was filled with all this Hellboy stuff, and it was all the stuff that's in the Kickstarter. And I was like, oh wow, that's a lot of stuff. That's way more stuff than I thought. So um, yeah, that'll that'll be I'll be getting that soon. So I'll, I'll be looking forward to it. I mainly just want to paint. Um, a lot of the stuff in there I don't like I, I the game looks cool too and I can see that but I do want to paint some of the models in there I don't know that I'll ever paint all of them Lord knows because there's a metric ton so there's that uh, Frederick asks Adam if your store doesn't do demos of a game you want to check out do you watch bat reps battle reports to get the flow of the game what kind of style do you like narrative or first person um, yeah, if I want to get the idea of how a game works and I can't find a demo of it anywhere from people playing locally or going to a convention or something like that, I do have a tendency to try to look for battle reports. I don't find a lot sometimes, especially like if I, the way it works is this. Most people don't do a lot of battle reports because uh, they don't do a lot of battle reports from unknown games because they don't get a lot of views. Um, going back to the question before about do you talk to other YouTubers, yes. Uh, I also talked to Ash Barker from Guerrilla Miniature Games uh, at Adepticon this year. We chatted for a little while. He does go back and do battle reports for little-known games. Um, so if you're looking for a game, you may want to check there to see if he's been doing a battle report for it or has done one in the past. So he does a lot of that. Uh, but most people don't. So... Um, it's sometimes harder to find battle reports like that. Every once in a while, if it's a big enough company and they've got enough video chops, they'll make their own battle reports. Um, or maybe they pay like uh, somebody to do it, like a battle or a Beast of War or somebody like that to make a battle report and all that kind of stuff. So that's fine. Um, 
but yeah, I don't generally watch a lot of battle reports myself. Um, yeah, I don't know, and I've still not completely decided. Like, I generally like. I don't know. I guess I don't know what you mean by first person versus narrative. I like the battle reports that I have a tendency to watch the most are the ones where I like the people and they are funny. Um, the battle reports that I watch the most these days is tabletop tactics. Uh, Lawrence and um, Bone and Stig and Chef and Beard and all those folks. Um, I enjoy watching many of them. I will admit I don't usually make it all the way to the end. I usually like they kind of have a conversation at the beginning and it's all that and they get playing and then eventually I because I can't watch those while I paint. I can't watch anything while I paint because then I stop painting. So um, for me battle reports a lot of the times are things that I watch like I've been painting or something like that and now I go upstairs and I either play a video game for a while before bed so that my eyes can kind of like refocus properly because I've been focusing here too close um, or else I or I watch like battle reports but then it's already late at night and I get a little sleepy and so I have fallen asleep in front of battle reports before so there's that uh, but yeah I'm not a great person to ask about what's the best type of battle report lord knows so anyway so yeah, that's where it's at, and it's a little bit after 11, so it is time for me to head out. Uh, Got to go do lunch with the in-laws and all that kind of stuff, and then I'm shooting more videos this afternoon, as long as everything works out right. So uh, I want to thank everybody again for coming to the show and being uh, here, and I am looking forward to being able to keep the schedule pretty good for a while, so we'll see you again in two weeks. But like I said, um, this upcoming Friday should be a Sam video, and... Um, I have two more after that, but not necessarily in a row. And I'm going to get the Monday videos back in line and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of where we're at. So uh, if I get to meet you at it to con or even at uh, the Fnord con in Austin, you know, I was glad, glad to meet you. And um, I hope that you had a good show. And I hope that this was fun for you. And we will see you again in a couple of weeks. So uh, thanks for watching.